Ladies and gentlemen, we got a three-way comparison today. 2024 Mazda MX-5 Miata Grand Touring RF against the 2024 Subaru BRZ TS that is tuned by STI against a, of course, Honda S2000 AP2. We're gonna start with the ND3. What you need to know is that these go for under 40K, but if you're a car enthusiast, if you're watching this channel, you're probably gonna get the club with the soft top with the BBR. That's the uh, Brembo BBS Recaro package. And that also actually has a very similar price point right around $39,000. So in this three-way comparison, this is by far the most expensive. We're powered by a two liter inline four making 181 horsepower, 151 pound-feet of torque. With the RF, it adds around 100 pounds. Now we're weighing 2,450 pounds. The soft top about 100 pounds lighter. With the RF, the added weight and higher center of gravity, we also have stiffer suspension versus the soft top. We also have Bilstein dampers for both the club and Grand Touring. The wheels, you know, I'm not the biggest fan on this new 2024 update. And we also have the front strut tower brace for both the club and the Grand Touring. In the interior, it is a little bit of a nice refresh and update to the ND2. Namely, the screen here, which is larger, higher resolution, thinner bezels. RF also cuts into your headroom. Not a fan of that. We do have this new uh, DSC off mode, which we've now engaged. And the main, two main updates from a driving perspective, the retuned E-Pass, the electric power assisted steering, which also has a lower friction setup now. You get better steering feedback than the ND2, as well as asymmetric LSD that actually increases rotation on corner exit. When you put the throttle down and increases stability on corner entry, so you don't get as much of that uh, rotation as you're entering the corner, which can sometimes surprise you, since this has a very short wheelbase, it's around 91 inches, it rotates quite a bit. All right, let's get these, there we go. The thing that I love about the Miata is that it just feels so natural. Out of these three, it is the lightest by far. The other two are weighing 27 to 2,800 pounds. Double wishbone front suspension. Really great feeling manual transmission. One of the best you can buy in today's market, brand new. It just feels so good. We're getting a lot of body roll, even with the um, with the RF. It is a little bit stiffer, but that's actually part of Mazda's philosophy: is that they want you to feel the body roll as another data point, another input for the driver and handling the car. But I find, and I think many others do as well, that it makes the car a little bit more unpredictable because it takes a second for it to set mid-corner. You don't get as much of a responsive driving experience, but very easily fixed in the aftermarket. In fact, for those who've been following this channel, you may know that I was initially gonna get an S2000, but I've actually changed my mind, which I'm gonna get to later in the video as to why I'm now gonna be getting an ND3 Mazda Miata. An approachable car as you get to the limit, but maybe not as much as the BRZ. It has that shorter wheelbase. But with that asymmetric LSD, we're getting more rotation when we put the throttle and we're getting not just understeer, but now you can get that balance point and play with the balance of understeer to oversteer, get that rotation, make it feel a little bit more neutral on corner exit, which is a nice update. Now I've driven all three of these before we started filming and I'd say that the ND3 is the best well-rounded driving experience. Not the best ownership experience that's well-rounded, but the best driving experience that's well-rounded. And what I mean by that is it doesn't have any significant weaknesses. Everything is pretty good to great. The manual transmission as an example, it is very mechanical, notchy, tight, not as good as the S2000, 
by one of the best manual transmissions that you can get on today's market. The throttle response, very natural, not no weirdness that you get from the BRZ and the GR86. The steering is by far the most natural, has the best feedback, the best weighting. It doesn't have that artificial fast ratio of the BRZ either. It's also the lightest out of the three. It is the most dedicated um, weekend car, if you will, in the sense that it's the most compromised. It's not, they're not trying to give you the practicality of the BRZ so that you can, you know, have it as your single car, your single dual duty vehicle. It is very much a second vehicle or third vehicle for most people. For me, it's gonna be my third vehicle. The drawbacks to it, the engine, not as inspiring as that S2000. It is a lot better in the ND3 versus the ND1. They made that change from the ND1 to the ND2 generation. But not a special, emotional, visceral. It revs out to 7,500 RPM. It has more torque than that S2000, but it is, um, it's not as inspiring of an engine. The stock setup in terms of body roll, I understand the philosophy of Mazda, but I think a lot of us would prefer that it be a little bit more planted from the factory, but again, you can change that in the aftermarket pretty easily. Let's do a pull. RPM redline, quiet engine, not the most, uh, I mean, in the aftermarket again, you can fix these things, but we're taking stock examples today. Out of the three, this is the one that has motorsport relevance and investment from Mazda. Unlike the S2000, you can also buy this brand new. It has all the creature comforts, the improved safety. But now it's time to see how the S2000 compares. Next up, we have the 2007 Honda S2000. That's the AP 2.5. We say 2.5 and not just two because now we have uh, drive-by-wire as well as trash control. And the car is mostly stock. We have NVIDIA Q300 exhaust. We have an aftermarket rear sway bar and K&N carb legal intake. Now this was purchased around $32,000 at 50,000 miles up in Oregon. And black on red on the interior, which you gotta love. Love the old McLaren Honda Formula One inspired dash. Love how this is also hidden behind that. Very driver focused. It's powered by the 2.2 liter F22C engine making 237 horsepower, 162 pound feet of torque with an 8200 RPM redline. They had to lower that redline from around 9,000 to 8,000 because they increased the stroke. That's how they actually increased the uh, overall displacement and that's more distance traveled by the piston. We're about 500 pounds heavier than the Miata. We're weighing a little bit over 2,800 pounds. Still have double wishbone front suspension. Now compared to the AP1, the AP2, they kind of Americanized the S2000 a little bit. They retuned the suspension and the sway bars to have less oversteer, make it less snappy. They also slowed down the steering ratio of course, giving us uh, more torque with the engine changes and some updates to the manual transmission as well. But man, this, you can hear that VTEC kicking right at 6,000. This engine transmission combination is such money. Transmission actually is more enjoyable to use than the ND3, but the, I think the ND3 has a technically superior transmission. Of course, they fixed the issues from the ND1 with the transmission there, but the ND3 transmission compared to that Honda S2000, it's, you're less likely to miss shift it, whereas the S2000, you occasionally will, because everything is so tight and gated, close together, but it has that bolt action, super tight mechanical feel. It's my favorite manual transmission. It feels so good. But the AP2, like, stock for stock, the AP1, in my opinion, is so much more fun to drive because you have that higher red line, 
the faster steering ratio, which gives you a little bit better feel in the front end. And you know, it's not as softened. It, it drives a little bit sharper, a little bit more responsive, a little bit more lively than the AP2. But you still do want to buy the AP2 over the AP1 for long-term ownership, as well as if you're gonna modify and track it, definitely the one to get. Definitely lacking torque, but once you hit VTEC, uh, it's just such a emotional, visceral experience, more so than the ND3. The chassis rigidity here is lower than in the ND3. It's a much older technology. This car is two decades old. The fact that we're even talking about it is impressive, but obviously safety and chassis technology from two decades ago, not as sophisticated as what we have today. So keep that in mind. Steering here is a lot more dead than in that ND3. Again, early Honda E-Pass. Doesn't really have that, that great feel to it. Doesn't really load up either mid-corner. The slower ratio, not doing it any favors either. with the AP1, but the AP2 has a 95 inch wheelbase, the Miata is around 91, the BRZ is around 101, but it's not just wheelbase, right, it's also the setup. Now with the 2006 and onward, they went to drive-by wire, which can sometimes cause a little bit of an inconsistency with the throttle response. But I want to tell you guys, why did I decide not to get an AP2? So I was pretty set on getting the AP2 because this speaks to the heart. The ND3 is definitely more of the logical purchasing decision. The S2000, I mean, getting this example, 50,000 miles for a 32K, um, I mean, you're, you're, it's, it's pretty expensive for what it is, let's be real. But it has that, that X factor that the ND3 doesn't. It really speaks to the heart. It has that more emotional, visceral, fun nature to it. But the reason I decided against it is my use case has changed. It is no longer going to be my third vehicle in Vegas where I'll be just tracking the shit out of it. My third car now needs to be in another city because my girlfriend moved and I'll be keeping a car with her. So now I need a car that's gonna be doing dual duty where I'll be driving it around town and also taking it to the track. And in that use case, the ND3 makes a lot more sense because daily driving something like an S2000 you can do it, especially if you're young, but if you're an old grandpa like me, you're 33 years old, it's gonna wear on you. It's not as comfortable, not as quiet, not as refined. And remember, that's a trade-off because what makes for a great sports car does not make for a great daily driver. And the ND3 being more comfortable, being more, uh, you know, being quieter and, and having less NVH and just being more refined, makes it less emotional, makes it less visceral. So for that use case, it makes more sense. So I've already placed my order for an ND3 club with the BBR package, Soul Crystal Red Metallic, soft top, manual transmission, obviously. And I mean, I'm excited for it, but every time I get behind the wheel of an S2000, this is just the more special vehicle to drive. It is the more emotional, engaging, fun vehicle to drive. Not as well-rounded, right? The steering, as an example, in the ND3 is a lot better. The fit, finish, interior build quality, safety. <laughs> God, I love these cars, man. So yeah, not as well-rounded of a vehicle as the ND3. It is, It has more flaws, but it has more charm, it has more character, it has more emotionality to it. It feels more special. I 
I would have very much been looking for an example just like this. Although, yellow exterior, Rio yellow. I love that color. That's also the car that I was always driving in Gran Turismo as a kid. But this to me, the DC2 Integra, the Honda S2000, the NA1 NSX, this to me is peak Honda. And I mean, the fact that we're still talking about it 20 years later, it just, it just, that says enough. All right, on to the BRZ TS. And last but certainly not least, we have the 2024 Subaru BRZ TS, TS standing for Tuned by Subaru. Now, what does that give you? It's $2,500 more than the limited manual trim, but you get Brembo brakes and you get tuned Hitachi dampers, which for $2,500, I'd say that's actually definitely worth it. It comes in around $36,000, which is $2,500 less than the ND3 Grand Touring we're driving. And again, the ND3 that you want is the club that has the BBR package, which still comes to the same price as that Grand Touring. Just like the S2000, it weighs in right around 2,800 pounds, except this one is a hardtop. So we have the best chassis rigidity and also the best practicality. This thing, I mean, I dailyed a FRS and then a GR86 for over 10 years combined, and that was just my only vehicle. And with the seats folded down, you can fit so much in the back. I was moving between apartments. I think for most people, this is actually the car you want. It also has the most torque. Now they rate this at 228 horsepower from the updated 2.4 liter flat four, but it's probably underrated, probably making something more like 240 at the crank. Whereas that first gen, which was rated at 200, probably like 190 to 195. That thing was, that thing was a dog. That engine was, was not great. It sounded like a garbage disposal and they fixed the torque dip here but they made some other changes which some are upgrades some are downgrades which we're going to get to shortly new for 24 the manual now comes with eyesight standard and you can see that right up here it's these sensors here and that includes their adaptive cruise control automatic emergency braking lane keeping features and lead vehicle start alert now getting to the interior you have the blue the stitching nice touches just like the limited, you still have the Alcantara, right? But now you have the STI logos in a few key places. Also, when you start up the vehicle, you see STI in the center there. Nice little touches, but the main thing you're paying for, the brakes and the dampers, which are actually a good upgrade. Now, one thing that's kind of annoying, you put it into track mode here, you don't get a digital numeric readout of the oil temp. It's only a scale, which doesn't matter for street driving as much, but on track, you definitely want a number or at least I find that easier rather than having that low resolution 190 to 270 there and just kind of estimating what your temps are actually at. Now, the FA24 engine, the flat four, making 184 horsepower now is a huge improvement. Although the sound, it has this fake uh, engine sound through the speakers, which you can actually unplug on the side. I did that in my, in my GR86 before I sold it. The engine now sounds like a it's like an angry cat purring. You hear that? Playing with the throttle a little bit just so you can hear those different tones. But, so, so first impressions, the, the Brembo brakes and the dampers, big improvement. The brakes actually so much more firm, way more confidence inspiring. That's a, uh, a shortcoming that I faced many times on the track, had to replace the rotors a lot. And these dampers, the car feels a little bit more planted. Still very predictable. Actually, out of the three, it is the most predictable. It has the longest wheelbase, too, at 101 inches. But compared to the GR86, which is a little bit more tail happy, this is a little bit more planted. And the other trims of the Subaru are significantly softer than the GR86 and more comfortable for daily driving. The front end styling is one of those things that kind of is polarizing. But compared to the S2000 and the ND3, this one feels a little bit artificial. The engine is the least inspiring. The transmission is also, it's not a bad transmission, but it has a little bit of slop to it, a little bit of lightness. It doesn't feel as tight and mechanical as the other two. The steering is artificially fast and it has a little bit of this weird stickiness right around center. 
which actually in this in this version right now with the TS 2024, I'm not feeling as much as in the other example. I remember when I first drove a 2022, I was really surprised. Now, the marketing team will tell you the steering is better in the second gen versus the first gen, but I definitely disagree. A lot less feedback. I'd say the steering goes from ND3, the best, then the BRZ, which has some feedback, but again, a little bit of this artificial nature to it. And then the S2000 and last. The transmission is S2000 first, ND3, and then this. This also has McPherson strut front suspension. So out of the three, the most compromised from a front suspension geometry getting some rotation it's a very neutral and balanced car that when you start pushing it harder on track you really feel that understeer limitation in the front you can dial in a lot of negative camber but with the other two cars you don't have to worry about that because they have a uh, double wishbone, which, which gives you that, that dynamic and increase in negative camber as you load up the front suspension. While the geometry is not ideal, here on the canyons, I would say the Subaru by far has the best suspension. These two Hitachi dampers are a big upgrade over stock, and the way that it can actually handle the bumps, the ride quality, it's a huge step up, and it's definitely the best balance point between comfort and performance. Out of the three, this is the most compromised for seater, not a convertible, McPherson strut front suspension not the most inspiring engine transmission combination. But I think for most people, it's actually the best pick. And actually the TS, these uh, Brembo brakes and the dampers is a pretty good deal at $2,500. You're getting a lot for that money. And if the ND3 is the best well-rounded driving experience, this is the best ownership experience well-rounded because NVH levels, practicality, it just makes a lot of sense. If this is your only vehicle, this is gonna be the easiest one to drive with. If it's not your second or third, is the steering a little bit artificial and especially the older model years have that, that increased stickiness and friction at center? Again, it seems reduced in this. I'd say, yeah, I mean, that's something that bothered me when I had my GR86, but you get used to it. The transmission, engine, not as inspiring, but it depends on your use case and your biases. I am more willing to overlook a lackluster engine if I get great chassis dynamics. And these are just so well balanced out, you know, right from factory. Again, if you take it to the track, you will feel the limitations. You will feel that understeer on the front. You will need your camber bolts at minimum. And uh, I think I got like 2.4 degrees of negative camber, which helped a lot, but still wasn't quite enough. This is the easiest one to learn on in terms of um, controlling limit behavior, right? Oversteer, understeer, learning how to handle a car at the limit, making you a better driver. This is the best tool. The Miata, I'd say, is second. The S2000, especially the AP1, can be a little bit snappy, a little bit more unforgiving in that way. Overall, you can't go wrong though with either one. These are all right around the same price point. Again, this one is the most expensive version of the BRZ, but if you compare it to the most expensive version of the uh, Miata, or not the most expensive version, I should say, but the uh, the most desirable for the car enthusiast, the club with the soft top BBR package, uh, it's about $2,500 cheaper. And the S2000 used, I mean, 50,000 miles, still $32,000 on the used market. So, if it were my money and it was just one vehicle, it'd be the BRZ. As a dedicated track toy, it would be the Honda S2000. And as a mixed purpose vehicle, being one that I need to be able to uh, take to the track, but also drive around town, it's the Miata. And that's why I am getting the Miata because I do have my other more practical vehicles in Vegas, but when I'm visiting my girlfriend, I need something to drive around, even if it doesn't have to be as practical as a BRZ. Uh, it's much more comfortable and reasonable in that use case versus an S2000. But again, you can't go wrong with either one. They're three amazing options. Lightweight, Japanese, front engine, rear wheel drive. We're truly lucky to have them. And you know, with the way things are going with EVs and such, it is such a treat that Mazda and Subaru and Toyota are still making these awesome, fun driver's cars.
Big thanks to Josh, the owner, for letting us review his Honda S2000. Big thanks to Mazda and Subaru for loaning us these two vehicles. Fenton Sun from the Zygon YouTube channel for making this review possible. My friends, if you want your car reviewed, visit us on jabalancars.com. Fill out the form on the homepage. Much love, and I'll see you all in the next one.